Welcome back to the podcast. Today is going to start with Freud again. We left off with Freud in the last episode, but we're going to jump 20 years in his career from the dream work, the the writing he did on dreams that was in his his magnum opus of 1899, The Interpretation of Dreams. He gave it the publication date of 1900, even though it was a little early for that officially because he thought of it as a book of the future. And we're jumping to 1920 to a treatise called Beyond the Pleasure Principle. So first of all, what is the pleasure principle? Well, if you recall from the discussion of dreams, that every dream, according to Freud, is ultimately a wish fulfillment. Freud thinks at that point in his career, and until this point, that the fundamental motive of the human mind is pleasure. And now, that doesn't mean that we're always doing everything we can to maximize as much pleasure as we can in the moment, um, or in a way we are, but obviously we don't you know, act out our wishes all the time. And that's because we develop early on, according to Freud, uh, another principle called the reality principle. And so he imagines a child coming into the world as you know, pure craving and recognizing eventually that he, the, the baby can't get what he wants immediately simply by reaching for it and then recognizes that reality is not going to yield pleasure to him instantaneously upon the moment that he wishes it. And so he learns uh, that he has to uh, adapt to reality in order to, to get as much pleasure as possible. So in a way, we continue to maximize pleasure. That is the primary motive of our minds. But when we recognize that reality doesn't yield our wishes the moment that we wish them, we suppress them, uh, we inhibit them, we we put them in abeyance for the moment, and we grapple with reality and we adapt ourselves to it so that in the long term we can achieve our goals. Now that was Freud's operating principle for the mind uh, until this treatise in 1920. So he, he assumed that we were pleasure-seeking organisms fundamentally until 1920, and the title of this treatise signals a departure. It's called Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Now, it might sound like he was already beyond the pleasure principle when he postulated the reality principle, but really the reality principle is just a special case of the pleasure principle. It's the pleasure principle that recognizes in order to get what it wants, it has to be more sophisticated than just raw reaching out for the goal of its desire. So the reality principle is not yet beyond the pleasure principle. And Freud, at this point, feels the need to go beyond the pleasure principle to postulate something else uh, that's a rival to the pleasure principle, something that's not there to achieve more pleasure in the long run, but to do something completely different, uh, perhaps even to cause us pain, uh, and ultimately, he argues, death. So the clinical symptom that prompts this, I mean, some people think that what prompts it is World War I, which had just finished two years earlier, and the massive destruction and insanity of that war, uh, it's hard to look at a phenomenon like that and think that humans are ultimately pleasure-seeking mechanisms. Uh, if so, we're really bad at it. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a need, it seems, uh, in the face of something that catastrophic to postulate some other darker um, drive. But the immediate clinical symptom that Freud's grappling with is... Um, dreams that are repetitive and traumatic, or at least recall trauma. So he is thinking of World War I vets uh, with the condition that was at the time called, in the English-speaking world, shell shock, and which we now call PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And one symptom of that condition is repetitive dreams that, uh, you know, it's not just that the ex-soldier has the dream every, same dream every night, but that it causes a panic reaction every night upon waking. And in Freud's earlier theory, the, the dream theory of 1899, he had room to grant that uh, people wake up anxious from dreams. But that was because the dream work malfunctioned. So you may recall there's a latent content or a, a deep, even forbidden wish that can't be satisfied even in a dream by, you know, straightforward uh, imagination because it would make us too anxious because the, the wishes are forbidden after all. And so the dream work has to massage, manipulate, distort, 
that latent content into something that he calls the manifest content. And that is supposed to give us the pleasure of the original uh, wish, uh, perhaps in a muted form because it's not a direct imagination of the, what we want, but it's been adapted uh, and compromised enough that it doesn't make us anxious. So we get a compromise between the, the raw pleasure we sought uh, in the latent content and a dream that uh, you know, keeps us sleeping and doesn't make us too anxious. That's, that you can see in that the combination of the two principles I mentioned earlier, the pleasure principle and the reality principle. The pleasure principle is uh, the latent content seeking the fulfillment of the wish, and the reality principle is the work of the dream work, uh, making sure that the sleeper sleeps on. Now, the reality principle has to deal with, uh, in waking life, has to deal with the physical world and social conventions and prohibitions, but that all gets internalized into the mind, especially the social conventions, and that's why the dream work is uh, necessary even when we're sleeping. So, Freud had a technique, he already had an explanation for dreams that cause us anxiety, but he felt that the repetitive nature and the, the real panic caused by these dreams of these ex-soldiers required something more. And that's what this treatise supplies, this something more. Looking to the conclusion that something more is going to be called the death drive, that behind those dreams and behind uh, you know, darker uh, criminal behavior in, in waking life, there is this force in us that isn't seeking pleasure. It's more fundamental even than this, this search for pleasure, and that is the organism's own wish to die. All right, so that's where we're headed. Uh, there are points in this argument where Freud could go left or right, and if he keeps going right, if you like, he ends up with a death drive. And so I'll try to signal at what points he could have gone left, because the death drive has not been... Um, accepted by most psychoanalysts. It's considered a, a kind of wild speculation without sufficient clinical evidence. And so there's a real question whether Freud needed to make that speculation. And he's quite explicit about the fact that it's a speculation and that he, that he does have insufficient evidence to make it. So let's start with the, the less controversial parts of this treatise. Freud observed his grandson uh, playing a game called now the Fort Da game. Uh, the German words are uh, fort, gone, and da, there. This uh, grandson uh, was left at home by Freud's daughter, uh, who, who died around the time that he was uh, um, publishing this treatise, or writing it, in fact. Although I think he has a note saying that, um, that her death, although it saddened him greatly, didn't affect the writing of this treatise because he had written it already before she died. But at any rate, he's telling a story now about when she was alive and how she would leave the house uh, regularly and leave the grandson um, by himself. Well, you know, he's surely attended by other people, but but he was he would leave, she would leave him without her, and he loved and adored her. And so, uh, you would expect the child to cry, but Freud noticed the child's not crying. Instead, he's playing this game, the Fort Da game. And he called it that because those are the words that the grandson used in the game. He would be in his crib and throw um, toys out of the crib. And Freud insists that this boy was exemplary in his behavior except on this one point. This is when he was a naughty boy throwing things out of his crib. And he would say, fort, uh, that these objects were gone. And eventually he had a toy that had a string on it. And he th would throw it out and say, fort. And then he would pull the string back and say, da. So it was a, there she goes, here she comes back. And that's exactly how Freud interprets it, that the boy is reenacting this trauma, if you like, this wound uh, that he's experiencing on a daily basis. In reality, with regard to his mother, he's reenacting it with this object, the toy. And why is he doing that? Because when the mother leaves... He is a passive victim, if you like, of the event. There's nothing he can do. She kisses him on the cheek and she leaves. But when he plays the game with the toy, he's now an active, he's the agent. He's in control of the game. So he's turned passive into active, a principle that um, many psych psychoanalysts see uh, in, in all sorts of behavior. For example, uh, child, the way in which 
uh, children who have been bullied uh, or abused um, grow up and have higher incidences of bullying and abusing other people, the psychoanalytic interpretation there is that they're turning passive into active. To think about the significance of this principle, I like to remember a quotation by a Scottish psychoanalyst from the 1950s uh, named Fairbairn. And he said, it is far better to live as a devil in a world of angels than an angel in a world of devils. Putting it in terms of the child's mind, because what Fairbairn's describing is how it would seem to a child. So translating it to the way in which the child would think, it's better to be a bad kid in a good world than to be a good kid in a bad world. Think about a child who's in a family that's abusing him. Uh, and, you know, and imagine him, to really exaggerate the case, imagine him being isolated, that this is really his only experience, the abuse of his family. If it's his only experience, he can spin it in at least two different ways. One is that he's being really good, or at least he's being neutral, not doing anything wrong, and his parents are abusers. Uh, it's a bad world. Now, that's the truth. I'm asking you to imagine this scenario. He's a good kid in a bad world. But that is a terrifying thought, imagine for a child, that he's completely helpless and his parents, the people who should be guarding and protecting him, are in fact harming him. So how could he deal with that? To create a fantasy in which this abuse is happening not because the parents are bad, but because he's bad. And that's why it would be in his now fantastic um, mind and you know, in his imagination that would deal with this real pain, he would think it's better to be this bad kid that I am in a good world. Mommy and daddy are not bad, they're good. And what's gained by this is the transmission of a passive experience into an active one. And it's done here, of course, in fantasy. He can't control the beatings, let's, let's say. But in his mind now, he feels like he has some control because if it's all happening because he's a bad kid, well, now he just has to become a good kid and it will stop happening. So he can have hope, he can have some control, he can come up with rules of, of behavior for himself. And, and uh, you know, eventually he'll be disabused of the fantasy, but it could get him through some rough years. So at any rate, that's a later psychoanalyst who has that, to my mind, uh, very deep thought, which of course you can apply to theology as Fairbairn does when he said it is far better to live as a devil in a world of angels than an angel in a world of devils. Think of the abusive uh, family as a world full of evil, such as our own. It would be better to think of ourselves as bad in this world and that it's ruled by a good God and that the reason these things are happening is because of some sin, some original sin that we've committed. Then it would be to think, no, we didn't do anything wrong. We're neither good nor bad. We may even, in fact be good. The world is just full of evil and there's nothing we can do about it. That is a terrifying thought. That's the nihilistic thought that uh, takes a lot of bravery to actually face. Now, I'm not, this is not to say that uh, the, the idea of a benevolent, omnipotent God is false, but it's only to say that it's easier psychologically to live in a world where, or in, in an imaginary world where uh, you believe that to be the case, uh, whether it's true or not. And by imaginary, I didn't mean to say not existing, but in your imagination, that's how you would conceive it. So at any rate, back to Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle. The Fort Da game is evidence for this principle. He is developing that the mind uh, strives to turn passive into active. And he then argues that in the human mind, there is what he calls a repetition compulsion or a compulsion to repeat. Now, here's a place where we can go left or right. We could go left if we think that the compulsion to repeat is the effort to turn passive into active. So, um, you know, if the boy just keeps repeating that game, you could see it as ultimately the pleasure principle. He's ultimately trying to enjoy his life and by turning passive into active, that's the best route to pleasure. And so he keeps doing that game. Uh, and he's not getting control over reality in, in, in the end because his mother keeps leaving. And so he keeps doing it. Uh, you know, as obsessional as that might be, as, as harmful as that might be, it's still not breaking 
the, pre- the pleasure principle, the, the fundamental nature of the pleasure principle. So that would be a way of going left, but that's not the way that Freud goes. Freud goes right, uh, so to speak, and says instead, there's just this thing in our mind that just wants to repeat. So going left, yeah, that's my, my terms. Going left in this case would be we, we, our minds try to repeat things. They have repetition compulsions for the sake of pleasure. Going right in this case would be our minds have this tendency to repeat, have a repetition compulsion for its own sake, for no other reason than just repetition. And Freud, again, draws some of his evidence for this from the observation of children. He notices that children, uh, when you tell them a joke that they like, they want to hear the joke over and over again. And they don't find it any less funny on the fifth time than they did on the first. In fact, they might find it funnier. Similarly with uh, games. They, they don't get as bored as we do uh, with games. Um, they like to do the rituals over and over again. Or a story that you read to a child at night. When a, when a child fastens onto a story and really likes that story, she wants to hear it told in exactly the same way every night. I certainly experienced this with my kids. I would vary the stories for my own amusement and, and it would make my son angry. So Freud thinks that children are uh, in, in uh, closer contact with that fundamental feature of the human mind, this compulsion to repeat. Now, at this point, I want to read a passage from this treatise because Freud is going to illustrate in this passage how this compulsion to repeat shows up in adult life. And I'll give you a hint. He's going to describe a series of men who have fates, and uh, they're all him. <laughs> he's speaking as if these are you know, patients or you know, characters that he's encountered, but they, if you know Freud's biography, uh, you know that these are, these are patterns of his own life. And before I read it, I'll, I'll remind you, if you listened to an earlier episode, I'm pretty sure I talked about Heraclitus's uh, aphorism, number 119 in the catalog. Um, the Greek is athos anthropo daimon, and that means uh, character to a human fate. And as I said in the earlier episode, it's ambiguous because, well, first of all, anthropo, the human, is stuck or sandwiched between these two things, character, ethos, and fate, daimon, uh, demon, would be the transliteration. The the human is stuck between those two things. Uh, But the Greek word order doesn't indicate what's the primary subject and what's the predicate. So character is fate for a human or fate is character for a human. Uh, Heraclitus is leaving it deliberately ambiguous. Uh, Freud doesn't believe in fate. Uh, He's anti-metaphysical in that respect. He's not Sophocles. So for him, character is for a human fate, namely what seems like our fates, uh, these compulsions to repeat patterns, uh, are in fact features of our character. And in this treatise, the question is, do we get those repetition compulsions because our pleasure principle has... Got, gotten, go, things have gone wrong. Things have malfunctioned. Uh, the reality principle hasn't uh, adapted properly to, to us, to reality. Or is it something more fundamental that we are caught up in these neurotic repetitions for their own sake, that something is driving us to do it for its own sake without any yield of pleasure and that that's not a malfunction. That's simply what it's doing. So, all right, I'll read this paragraph from Beyond the Pleasure Principle. What psychoanalysis reveals in the transference phenomena of neurotics, and I should explain transference phenomena, well, neurotics, people who uh, you know, especially experience a lot of guilt and have ritualistic, sometimes obsessional uh, behavior, very uh, self-scrutinizing. At any rate, transference phenomena is a universal phenomenon in psychoanalysis, according to psychoanalytic theory. It's the idea that we take templates of experience, especially from our childhood, and we apply them to circumstances in our adult life, uh, in in situations that might in some ways be quite different, and we treat those later situations as if they're just repetitions of the earlier situation. So to take cliche examples, if you had a father who uh, beat you and had a beard, then as an adult, when you see men with beards, you encounter them as if they're going to beat you. So you might not even consciously think he's going to beat me, but you might cower in the presence of someone with a beard. That would be a transference phenomenon, transferring from the past uh, 
a set of reactions, thoughts, fantasies, desires even, to a situation in the present where there is some association. Remember how fluid free association can be. There's some association that warrants the transference, but there are many features of the present or future scenario that don't match the past. So people go wrong, uh, in, according to psychoanalysis, because oftentimes because they're doing this and they're treating the present as if it were the past. And in the past, they were children. They had primitive ways of dealing with the complexity of life. And now they're adults and they need to work through, as he'll say in another um, essay that I'll talk about later, not today, but in another episode, uh, they need to work through. All right, let me resume this. I'll start again. What psychoanalysis reveals in the transference phenomena of neurotics can also be observed in the lives of some normal people, whoever they are. The impression they give is of being pursued by a malignant fate or possessed by some demonic power. Remember, ethos anthropo daimon. But psychoanalysis has always taken the view that their fate is for the most part arranged by themselves and determined by early infantile influences. So people seem to be living out fates, but in fact it's what happened to them when they were children, especially babies. Uh, but oftentimes when he says infantile, he means children who are three, four, five years old, the so-called Oedipal phase. They're repeating uh, those experiences in distorted ways. So to continue, the compulsion which is here in evidence differs in no way from the compulsion to repeat which we have found in neurotics. Even though the people we are now considering have never shown any signs of dealing with a neurotic conflict by producing symptoms. So if these stories are indeed references to Freud's own life, as, as I'm sure they are, he's saying, here's a normal person or a series of normal people, that is people who are not neurotics, and they show this repetition compulsion. And this would be an argument then, if they're normal, this would be an argument that the repetition compulsion is not a malfunction of the mind. It's not um, the reality principle has, uh, has gotten in the way of a fulfillment of pleasure, but rather it's a, it's a fundamental feature of the human mind because here it is even in a normal person. Continuing. Thus, we have come across people all of whose human relationships have the same outcome, such as the benefactor who is abandoned in anger after a time by each of his protégés, however much they may otherwise differ from one another, and who thus seems doomed to taste all the bitterness of ingratitude. Uh, one of the signal features of Freud's life as a, as a founder of psychoanalysis is that he would train a protege. Carl Jung is the most famous example of this, but there are three or four others. Train a protege, exalt him to you know, a leadership position in the psychoanalytic organization, and then that protege would start developing independent thoughts with which Freud disagreed, and they would have a falling out, and that person would leave and found some rival organization. So there's Freud, who's tasting the bitterness of ingratitude. Or the man whose friendships all end in betrayal by his friend. Or the man who, time after time in the course of his life, raises someone else into a position of great private or public authority, and then after a certain interval, himself upsets that authority and replaces him by a new one. I wonder whether this is a moment of self-awareness in Freud, that he sees that this pattern has happened a lot in his life, and it's not just that the protégés uh, are, are ungrateful in leaving him, but that he has somehow jeopardized the relationship and pushed them out. Now this next one uh, is in him. Or again, the lover, each of whose love affairs with a woman, well, this could be, I don't know his sex life as well as perhaps I should. Or again, the lover, each of whose love affairs with a woman passes through the same phases and reaches the same conclusion. Um, well, I suspect many people are familiar with this phenomenon, uh, especially by middle age. If you've had a number of relationships, you do start to see the patterns and realize it wasn't this person or that person or the, or the other uh, who brought the end about or the end about in the way that it came about, but it's got to be me because it can't be a coincidence that it's happened that many times. Freud continues, this perpetual recurrence of the same thing, and it, that's in quotation marks in the standard edition, the English translation, which Freud approved, uh, that's a reference to Nietzsche's eternal return, um, the eternal recurrence of the same, as he calls it, and we'll discuss that uh, in a much later episode. So Freud again, this perpetual recurrence of the same thing causes us no astonishment when it relates to active behavior on the part of the person concerned, and when we can discern in him an essential character trait 
which always remains the same and which is compelled to find expression in a repetition of the same experiences. In other words, it's strange that somebody would repeat the same pattern in human relationships over and over again, say, for example, always breaking up in exactly the same way. But if the person's the agent, if, it's the, if it, you, we can see clearly that he's the one doing this, it's not as mysterious as if the person is the passive recipient of the same behavior over and over again, as if somehow other people have been cast into a script by him, which is he's passive, but then he would also have to be active. That's the mystery. If Roy continues, we are much more impressed by cases where the subject appears to have a passive experience over which he has no influence, but in which he meets with a repetition of the same fatality. There is the case, for instance, of the woman who married three successive husbands, each of whom fell ill soon afterwards and had to be nursed by her on their deathbeds. He goes on, but just take that case to make the point. Uh, you know, assuming that she didn't kill them, uh, it is amazing that uh, all three of the men who married her died. Now, that can't be a coincidence, but uh, neither is it that mysterious. She was in some ways attracted to men who were about to die. You know, presumably these men had symptoms that she recognized, probably unconsciously, that for whatever reason she found attractive. So it looks like human beings have fate, and yet it's character. And what is going on in that character? Well, two possibilities again, the going left or going right. One possibility is that we fall into these repetitive patterns in a frustrated effort to achieve pleasure. Or, going right if you will, we fall into these patterns because there is something in us which is seeking repetition for its own sake. And as I say, that's going to be the interpretation that Freud eventually arrives at. We're quite close now. Uh, the penultimate point I want to make um, from this treatise is that Freud uh, gives a theory of trauma. And in this theory, he imagines the mind as, well, if you like, a, a bubble, uh, which has a, a skin. And a bubble is actually not a good analogy because uh, the skin of a bubble is so um, fragile. But he calls it a psychic skin. So you imagine the soul, abstractly speaking, the, the psyche, as having a barrier between itself, its interior, and the external world. He calls that a psychic skin. And perceptions, events in the external world, impinge upon that psychic skin. And we take some of them in, we, we repel others. We do that through processes that, you know, at this point, so abstract, there would be no need to uh, describe them, you know, Ultimately, this is a physiological process, but Freud's speaking metaphorically here that we have ways of digesting uh, things that uh, impinge upon the psychic skin, ways of taking in the things that we want and ways of keeping out the things we don't want. And so uh, it's, it's a porous boundary over which the subject has some control. But there are experiences from the external world that are so uh, forceful that they burst the psychic skin, they break through it, and so they can't be assimilated into the interior in the regular way. Rather, they enter of their own accord. And these are like having a shell explode next to you uh, in a trench in World War I and, and watching some gruesome death of your best friend, uh, trauma. And Freud thinks that when that happens and the force enters, pierces the psychic skin and, and starts disrupting the interior of the psyche, that forces are marshaled from within to try to master it. You know, in the same way that they would be marshaled before the skin had broken for a usual uh, perception, they would be marshaled to master you know, that impingement on the psychic skin and whatever, some, some of them would be assimilated into the memory and others would be repelled and ignored or whatever. That would be a turning of passive into active, to return to that earlier point. Um, and it would be successful. But when the traumatic wound happens, when the uh, force is so great that it pierces the psychic skin and, and enters directly into the heart of this bubble, I'm, I'm asking you to imagine, well, then the mind's efforts to master 
a phenomena. Its, its efforts to turn passive into active are doomed to failure because the regular procedure has been abrogated by virtue of the fact that the skin is ruptured. And so the effort to turn passive into active becomes repetitive because it's seeking a goal and it's not succeeding. It's over and over again trying to master the trauma and failing. Now, again, this is another point where Freud can go left or he can go right. Here are these poor, shell-shocked veterans who are having the same panic-inducing dream every night. And going left, so to speak, the interpretation is that they experience this skin-rupturing psychic wound in the trenches uh, when they saw that horrific event. And now they're dreaming about it exactly as it was, as uh, PTSD victims do, dreaming in literal detail an entire traumatic scenario. And it's happening every night because the mind is trying but failing, inevitably failing to turn passive into active, to master the trauma. This is going left because this would be the mind's effort to try and digest that trauma, to return to equilibrium in the mind, to achieve, if not pleasure, at least some peace. But Freud doesn't go left. He goes right and thinks that this uh, compulsion to repeat is not seeking pleasure, as I mentioned earlier, so that the repetitive dream is not, in fact, trying to master anything. It's simply trying to achieve its own end. And here is where the death drive enters. Freud speculates. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you know uh, it's pretty wild, but uh, you know, and I don't know that it has anything to do with the Black Mirror episode, so maybe we'll see in, in the discussions um, later. But Freud thinks, in a purely speculative fashion, that all organisms seek their own end. Um, you know, he's got in mind here a principle of thermodynamics and entropy, and you know, he sees evolution and entropy in this uh, dialectical relationship. At any rate, uh, starting with cells, uh, cells seek their own end. And, and that that pattern, he says, we should expect to find in a full-fledged organism, such as an adult human being as well. And when I think about this, the only, uh, the only actual biological evidence uh, I know of for this is what I've heard called a telomere, um, you know, a part of a chromosome at the end that uh, gets slowly damaged over time um, you know, I don't want to say deliberately because Darwinian evolution doesn't have deliberation or, or intentionality or rationality, but that the organisms that have these degenerating telomeres are the ones that were selected for because they reproduced more often and so they became more adaptable to the environment, whereas the longer living organisms didn't reproduce as often, weren't as adaptable, and so uh, natural selection selected for organisms that have a shelf life, that have a half-life, that die. So at that level, yes, there, there is a death drive. But at the psychic level, Freud just jumps, and, and he doesn't give the telomere evidence, but he, he jumps from his purported cellular evidence just directly to the psychic level and thinks there is something in human life, uh, in, an, in an individual, that is seeking one's own death. Uh, the other argument he has for this is that pleasure is... Uh, the reduction of tension. Uh, so you know, you've got some tension in your stomach when you're hungry and you fill it with food and then you relax. You can relieve the tension. And on that model of pleasure, what would be more pleasurable, he argues, than dying? <laughs> because that would be the ultimate reduction in tension. Well, there's a flaw in the conception of pleasure that maybe we'll examine it at some other point. Uh, pleasure is not always the reduction of tension. That's one way of thinking about it, but it's not uh, a universal condition of pleasure. At any rate, after posing this death drive, Freud now entertains an idea he calls primary masochism. So masochism is seeking self-harm, and he had assumed to this point that the phenomenon of masochism, you know, the fact that people do harm themselves, neurotics harm themselves by jeopardizing job interviews, jeopardizing relationships, and then of course there are people who um, you know, harm their own bodies. Uh, 
to this point, Freud believed that masochism was a secondary phenomenon, that uh, in its relationship with sadism, for example, that sadism was the primary phenomenon, that we are inherently aggressive and that we become masochistic only when we turn our primary sadism against ourselves. So masochism would be a secondary phenomenon derivative from sadism. In this treatise, he entertains, at any rate, the hypothesis that masochism is primary. There is something in us that's just simply seeking pain, and it is this uh, death drive. Okay, so uh, so much for Freud. The next uh, dis- the next topics will be uh, Stoicism in the person of Marcus Aurelius, and uh, a, an adaptation of Stoicism in a recent critique of uh, American culture and especially the culture on campuses by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in The Coddling of the American Mind. So in the second half of the episode, I'm going to talk, as I just said, about uh, Jonathan Haidt's book and the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And the hinge uh, between these is, well, for us, is a Black Mirror episode, uh, in this case, Playtest. Think about Cooper in that episode and the various threats that he experiences uh, in that house of horrors, the virtual house of horrors, you know, when it whether it's a matter of seeing spiders, which he's afraid of, or by the end being completely shattered with the confrontation of his own um, uh, replication of Alzheimer's, the fact that he d- can't remember anything and that he doesn't even know who he is. That's a, a gradation of wounds, psychic wounds that he's experienced. And when it's a matter of you know, seeing the spider crawling on the carpet when he first sits down to read a book in front of the fire, that's like what Freud's describing as a, you know, a perception coming to a psychic skin and being digested or absorbed by the psychic organism, if you like, uh, because it's small enough and there are you know, procedures that can handle the absorption of that small wound, if you like. Um, but as you know from having watched the episode, that there's an escalation of fear and in that uh, one of the final scenes, at least within the House of Horrors, he uh, recognizes that he can't remember anything and that he doesn't know who he is. And that's the kind of wound that Freud's talking about when it comes to um, a rupturing of the psychic skin. Now, we don't have the aftermath um, of Cooper trying to uh, adapt to life having suffered that because he comes out of the virtual reality and he's back to his old self, although, as you know, not quite his old self. And uh, th- that's the indication that we get, that this hasn't been a learning experience for Cooper in the way that it would have been if he'd simply seen a spider, even if he'd seen uh, Josh Peters' face on a spider, you know, the bully from high school. As scary as those were, he could absorb those experiences Uh, He could perhaps become desensitized uh, in his fear of spiders uh, or uh, spider bullies. But when the threat is so great that it, as Freud puts it metaphorically, it ruptures his psychic skin, uh, he's not able to recover. He can't absorb those, that experience and he's shattered. So the evidence we have of the change in Cooper is him flying home to uh, America and on the way to London, he, you know, he's ebullient and he helps uh, a little girl sitting across the aisle from him who's scared when the plane is going through turbulence. He's able to meet fear with courage and even joy. Uh, when he's returning, however, he is too anxious to help anybody and, and he can't even help himself. So that's important as we now transition to talking about Uh, Jonathan Haidt and and then Marcus Aurelius from Freud because the phenomena Freud was talking about, the conditions that Freud was talking about in Beyond the Pleasure Principle are of that kind of severity such as Cooper experiences at at the end of the House of Horrors, truly traumatic experiences. And, you know, I want you to think, uh, I'm certainly going to be thinking aloud about whether uh, Jonathan Haidt and Marcus Aurelius uh, appreciate the difference between the depth of that kind of wound uh, versus uh, the the digestible uh, wounds, attacks, perceptions that Freud thinks don't rupture the psychic skin. 
Okay, so with that in mind, let me, I'm going to do it in reverse chronological order. I'm going to start with Jonathan Haidt and then, and then go back to Marcus Aurelius at the end of, um, at the end of my discussion of his, his book, as, as I hope you'll see why in a moment. So I, I'm talking merely about the first chapter of his book, Coddling of the American Mind, which began as an Atlantic article in 2015 uh, upon the observation that the climate of American campuses, certainly the elite American campuses, was changing rapidly, in especially the year 2014 and, and 2015, after especially the uh, shooting in uh, of a black man by a white police officer in uh, Missouri in, I believe that was the summer of 2014. At any rate, uh, Jonathan Haidt and his, and his co-author Greg Lukianoff, who runs uh, an organization called, it's, the acronym is FIRE, but it's for free speech and freedom on university campuses, they, they noticed uh, the explosion of um, critiques of speakers especially who were being what's called deplatformed, not allowed to speak even after they'd been invited or when they did arrive um, uh, protests and new strategies to deal with their presence not critiques of the content of what they were saying but treating these speakers especially conservative speakers as if they were threats to the the body politic of the university threats to it's like as if they were uh, infections at any rate that was the climate in which they wrote their article in 2015 and then turned it into a book that appeared last fall, uh, uh, 2018, fall of 2018. And I'm just talking about one chapter in that book. But they begin that chapter with a distinction they borrow from um, Taleb, who distinguish between, first of all, the fragile and the resilient. That's a straightforward common distinction you know, between a, a teacup that's fragile and as a result... You, you guard it, you protect it, because if you don't and it falls off the table, it will shatter and it'll be ruined versus something resilient like a rubber ball. You don't guard that because it can easily absorb shocks. It doesn't change, however, which is what makes it resilient rather than, and this is Taleb's contribution, anti-fragile. Something that's anti-fragile is not like the resilient because... Um, it can be broken. The rubber ball, it's very difficult to break a rubber ball. The anti-fragile thing can be broken, but when it's broken, it's not broken in the way the fragile thing, like the teacup is broken, which is shattered and ruined, but rather it's, it's broken and then it mends itself. And something's an truly anti-fragile if it needs to be attacked or compromised or not, not entirely broken, but wounded in some way, if it needs that in order to grow. That's something that's anti-fragile as opposed to merely fragile or resilient. So what's a, a good example of this? Um, Taleb has all sorts of examples in his book, but the one that um, Haidt and Lukianoff exploit is the human immune system. And they talk about uh, peanut allergies, which um, exploded in the 90s because, well, you know, speaking for myself, I didn't know a single person who had a peanut allergy when I was growing up in the 70s and the, and the early 80s. Uh, and that's borne out by the statistics. I gather, if I recall, they say four out of every 1,000 kids had a peanut allergy in that time. Uh, but it's gone up. I think it's now 14 out of 1,000. So it's more than doubled, um, uh, well, tripled, I suppose. Uh, since then. So what happened in the 90s? Well, that's when uh, people became aware of peanut allergies and thought that the way to protect children was to prohibit uh, peanuts and peanut-derived products and, in fact, even um, food items from factories where, uh, even though they had nothing to do with peanut products, they were, in, they were produced in the same factory that produced peanut products, a complete ban on peanuts and anything associated with peanuts because there's a possibility, in fact there is, there has been, that a kid, one of the four out of the thousand, would be harmed by this. And what that ban was doing in the terms of Taleb was treating the entire population as fragile. Now, some of the kids you know, truly were fragile when it came to peanuts. They, they were the four out of the thousand who really would be harmed. But there was a cost for everyone else, or at least some of the others, because 
not being exposed to peanut products and you know including you know parents in the household would be doing this uh, with with babies when they weren't exposed to any peanut products they eventually became allergic to them in in a way that they wouldn't have if they'd been exposed early because their immune system missed the crucial stage at which it would have developed the right reaction to the peanut. Now, it's not actually the peanut. I think it's the skin on the peanut. But at any rate, there was a study where uh, the scientists took a population of children who are predisposed to have allergies already. These were kids, I think, with eczema. And they you know, did a double-blind study in which half of the kids were prohibited from eating peanuts by their parents in their schools. And the other half were encouraged to be fed peanuts. And at the end of the study, after they'd grown, um, 17 of the group that were prohibited from uh, consuming peanut products, 17% of them developed peanut allergies. Whereas in the other group, the other 50% who had been allowed to eat peanut products, in fact, they were required, they had to eat this peanut paste, I think, two or three times a week, only 3% became allergic, I guess, as teenagers to peanut products. And that's because the immune system is neither fragile nor resilient in most cases, but it's anti-fragile. It needs to be attacked uh, in some you know, mild ways at any rate for it to, to develop the right reactions and antibodies. It's that flexible. It's not uh, prepared to meet every threat. It needs to meet certain threats in order to develop the right architecture in order to respond. Obviously, I'm not a biochemist, so I'm, I'm using pretty vague vocabulary here, but it's an example of something that's anti-fragile. And it's analogous, almost directly, to what they want to talk about, which is the human mind. So is the human mind, especially in its emotional capacity, is it fragile, resilient, or anti-fragile? And Haidt and Lukyanov speak as if it's anti-fragile. And it is, I think, just as the immune system is anti-fragile. And that's to say that if the human mind or heart, and you know, the mind or soul in its emotional capacity is not given certain kinds of experiences, uh, upsetting experiences, uh, at, you know, at the right times in emotional development, it doesn't develop the right or the best uh, emotional reactions. Uh, you know, the, exam the clear example here from Black Mirror is Archangel, where the uh, character, Sarah, if I'm not mistaken, is given an archangel implant when she's very young that um, keeps her from experiencing any stressful perceptions, you know, the barking dog or the terrorist videos or the pornography and, and so on. She doesn't develop um, healthy reactions to small doses of stressful phenomena. And so when the implant is removed. Well, before it's removed, she develops all kinds of problems, as anyone who's seen the episode knows. And then when it's removed, she doesn't have the, re the emotional resources to deal with those full-fledged stressful uh, experiences in her teenage life. And the end is disastrous for her and, and for her mother who had that implant installed. So that episode, uh, you know, which we'll discuss in much more detail in an episode devoted to an episode of this podcast devoted to discussing it but uh, just to use it as as to anticipate as an example here of uh, the argument of Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff that's an argument that's an example that the human mind the soul is anti-fragile uh, she should not have been treated as fragile, which is what the archangel implant did as if she's a teacup and needs to be protected from certain things uh, but neither is she resilient. She can't be uh, just as a child, just thrown into you know dangerous city, for example. No, there, she's in between. She's anti-fragile, but she has to be dosed with these difficult experiences. Nothing can be too overwhelming. Uh, you know, small doses of stressful things, like walking by a barking dog, and <clears throat> this is the point at which. Um, you know, I guess I'll come back to this as well. We need to be careful what kind of threats we're talking about because if we say the human mind, the soul, is, is anti-fragile, yes to things like a barking dog or uh, watching um, 
images on YouTube that are, you know, like the terrorist beheading is one of the ones that she uh, is shown. And I, I can't remember whether she can see it or she can't, depending on whether she had the implant in at that time or not. Those are not going to be traumatic experiences in the sense that we were using that word uh, when we discussed Freud. Those are not experiences like having a shell explode next to you in the trenches and watching your friend be dismembered. So we need to be careful. Are we talking about small doses of suffering and difficulty and stress? Or are we talking about massive, overwhelming, psychic skin rupturing trauma? And the human mind, I think Freud is right in that metaphor at any rate, that the human mind is anti-fragile for the small doses of everyday life. And some people can be quite resilient, in fact. Um, you know, people differ. This is an amazing thing about post-traumatic stress syndrome, that two people who experience the same trauma, one of whom is devastated for the rest of his life, the other of whom goes back to a, a normal life. And I, I don't know that we know yet what the difference is. But when it comes to those experiences, enough people are fragile. And so we can't just say, as I said a moment ago, and I think I was being... I was representing what was being said in the chapter of the coddling of the American mind. We can't say simply the human mind is anti-fragile. It's, it's anti-fragile to many things. So too the immune system. The immune system is anti-fragile to many viruses, like the viruses that give us the, the common cold. But it's not anti-fragile to viruses like HIV, for example. To those kinds of viruses, it's fragile, and we need to make the distinction. At any rate, when it comes to campuses, Haidt and Lukianov set up what they see as this explosion of um, treating students as if they're fragile rather than anti-fragile. They attribute it to what they call concept creep in the notion of safety. And they, they call this ideology safetyism. So in the 60s and 70s, there was, as there has always been, a clear notion of physical safety. And then with the diagnosis of PTSD, there was a bridge between physical safety and what has been called only quite recently emotional safety. And Haidt and Lukianov are critical of that bridge. Uh, not, not, they're not critical of the bridge. They're critical of the notion of emotional safety, that people in their emotional life are fragile. They think in, people in their emotional life are anti-fragile. And have that that concept creep having happened in their estimation students on campuses are because they're now being treated as fragile rather than anti-fragile are, are being um, treated as it, like teacups that they might be damaged uh, by speakers as i mentioned earlier and so the episode they talk about and i think this happened in 2014 or 2013 uh, and they discussed it in their original article Two feminists came to the campus, I believe, of Brown University, and one of them was unorthodox. And I don't even know if, in the end, the, her critics would have considered her a feminist. But at any rate, I think the discussion was about rape culture, and she was going to deny that there was such a thing in the United States, uh, as, as, it, as it's typically called, uh, rape culture. And student leaders thought that that opinion was itself threatening to the emotional safety of some brown students, uh, again, treating those brown students as fragile in this respect. And so they established um, what they called a safe space. And I don't know if this is the first time that safe space was ever used, but um, they established a safe, I guess it was the first time a safe space was used for a speaker. And uh, people who were traumatized in their estimation by hearing that opinion could retreat into the safe space where there was videos of puppies and crayons to draw with and jello and so on and so on. They were being infantilized. Another technique that Haidt and Lukianov talk about is the, the trigger warning, the idea that things that students may read, certainly uh, images they may see in films, uh, are uh, could re-traumatize people. So especially in the case of sexual assault, if someone's been sexually assaulted and has experienced PTSD as a result of that uh, trauma, that reading accounts of sexual assault or seeing images of sexual assault can trigger the panic and the other reactions of the PTSD and that those students are owed some warning that those triggering episodes 
uh, will be ahead in the reading that's being assigned to them or in the film that they are being asked to watch. Um, this doesn't happen at my university yet, as far as I know. I'm not, not to say that some professors don't use trigger warnings, but there's been no public discussion, as far as I know, about using trigger warnings. So uh, I teach the Black Mirror episodes, um, and I don't give trigger warnings. I, I do tell my students at the beginning of the course that there are violent episodes, the dismemberment of a corpse, for example, and there are uh, scenes of sexual intercourse and my students say that um, triggering, or not triggering, they don't use that word, but that um, offensive, some of the things they find offensive are watching drug use, which is a bit of a mystery to me because it's not clear to me why, whatever your opinion on drugs, no matter how bad you think they are, why watching someone do them on a screen would be offensive. But at any rate, um, I deal with this in my course by, a, I guess, a broad trigger warning by telling the students that there are these things in these films. I'm in a Catholic university, and so especially when it comes to sexual content, I have to be careful. And um, you know, I spoke with my dean about it, and he, he said, look, if the scenes are integral to making the point of the film, integral to making the philosophical point that you're trying to make in your course, then they should watch those scenes. Uh, but if they're gratuitous, then there's no need for the students to see those scenes. And so I, I tell the students that, that in, in certain episodes, there's going to be, for example, a dismemberment of a corpse. And as far as I can tell, that's not integral to understanding anything uh, essential about the episode Bandersnatch. Um, you know, some, of the, some of the brutality is, I think, integral. So in Archangel, when um, Sarah beats her mother uh, with the Archangel device uh, in the face, I find that very, very difficult to watch. And it's gruesome, but it seems to me... Well, I don't want to say essential uh, to understanding it, but to, to really see the, the state that she's in at that point does seem to me essential. I'm thinking of Greek tragedy where there was bloody scenes at the end, but that they happened obscena, the obscene, which in, in, in uh, Latin is off the stage, obscena. Uh, it's always a messenger or somebody else who comes in and describes the horror that happened off stage. Um, that doesn't happen so often in films. Now we, we see it directly. So uh, arguably it's not necessary that it be there. So I don't give trigger warnings as such. I don't say, you know, at this point you're going to witness this and, and it could just be that, you know, I haven't recorded them, but um, you know, I'm not prepared enough to do it. But I tell the students you, you could skip over uh, these scenes if, if you need to. There's no need uh, to see these things in order to have a discussion about the philosophical ideas. So at any rate, that is as part of the climate. As I say, it's not required by my campus, but it's part of the climate uh, nowadays. So Haidt and Lukianov are very critical of safetyism and these new techniques of safe spaces and trigger warnings and so on because they think that they are harming students rather than helping them because it, they're treating the students as fragile rather than anti-fragile. Both Haidt and Lukianov, and I gather especially Lukianov, are proponents of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT for short. And uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, like so many psychotherapies, is downstream, uh, very far downstream from Freudian psychoanalysis, which we've already discussed quite a bit in this podcast. Uh, but it's very different from Freudian psychoanalysis and even, um, you know, less rigorous psychotherapies that one can easily find nowadays, talk therapies. Difference between those talk therapies that you know are closer in allegiance to Freudian psychoanalysis on the one hand and cognitive behavioral therapy, which is quite a departure from Freudian psychoanalysis. The difference is that the, the talk therapies I'm imagining as being downstream from Freud, let's just say Freudian psychoanalysis. The difference between Freudian psychoanalysis and CBT is that Freudian psychoanalysis is trying to bring the unconscious into consciousness. And it's often a historical inquiry into the childhood infantile precedence for present adult phenomena. Remember, I mentioned transference phenomena when I explained that passage from Beyond the Pleasure Principle. So there are various ways this is done. Uh, you know, the cliche in the movie of 
the you know the patient who has the aha moment where he realizes what the trauma was that happened to him when he was a child and, and then is instantly cured because he's made the unconscious conscious that's not happening in psychoanalysis but there is an emphasis on going into the past and especially through free association uh, converting the unconscious material into conscious material where it can be worked on where and worked through on the other hand cognitive behavioral therapy as as i understand it i'm not uh, intimately familiar with it it's not concerned with the history of the symptoms it's concerned merely with the present phenomena the symptoms themselves and rather than probing uh, through free association for example uh, a network of emotions and you know their relationships with one another and trying to work through them in this complicated psychoanalytic way that I'll talk about in a later episode. Instead, it focuses, as the name suggests, on the cognitive, that is, the way in which these symptoms or the way in which the life of the patient is being thought about. So it deals with the surface and with thinking as opposed to Freudian psychoanalysis, which is you know, more concerned with emotions and imagination on the one hand and, uh, and with depth, the unconscious. So Lukianoff, especially, and, and Jonathan Haidt as well, are proponents of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I gather from their account that the standard way in which a CBT therapist would address someone with a phobia, for example, let's say a fear of elevators, would be to teach them patterns of thinking that will minimize their anxiety when they step into an elevator and that they need to step into elevators uh, armed with those techniques of thinking, you know, mantras or whatever it is, and do it in small doses until they become desensitized to the thing that's making them anxious. And so again, remember Playtest and Cooper's encounter with the virtual spiders in the House of Horrors. CBT would, I gather, argue that that could be therapeutic for him to experience those small doses of spiders, especially if he learns how to think about his reaction and adjust his reaction according to uh, the way he should be thinking about it and not as something truly scary. As opposed to getting on to the couch in Freudian psychoanalysis and free associating about elevators and, you know, probably with the idea that what's going to be therapeutic in the analysis is not even going to be a direct attack on the symptom of anxiety about elevators, but uh, a bringing to light of you know, a, a huge network of emotional associations uh, in, as I say, the complicated way in which people in psychoanalytic therapy work through uh, their symptoms such that you know, after years, the person isn't afraid of elevators. It's, a, it's an indirect method. And it goes deep rather than staying on the surface. And it's concerned, especially with the imagination, more than it is with thinking. So because Lukianoff and Haidt are proponents of cognitive behavioral therapy and that idea of dosing, um, the thing that makes you afraid, uh, if it's fear that's your problem, uh, then they think that people who are the people calling for trigger warnings, people who actually are triggered, by accounts, for example, of sexual assault in literature or, or, or depictions of it in film, that they'll get better not by avoiding these things in the way that trigger warnings uh, help them do or retreating into a safe space where they don't have to confront the idea or the opinion or the argument that's making them upset. Uh, instead, they should be sitting, you know, Maybe not in the front row, too high a dose, but in the auditorium and uh, thinking about that opinion uh, in, a, in a different way. And if cognitive behavioral ther therapy is therapeutic, then in a um, healthier way. So it's, again, it's not just that they think that this campus climate is diminishing free speech. They do think that. Uh, or that it's inhibiting educational opportunities for students who need to be exposed to competing ideas in order to develop their own views independently of orthodox thinking. They think that too, but their critique is therapeutic in this case, that they think that students would become healthier if they were to approach the source of their fear uh, in this CBT way. 
Now, in the second half, well, in the next um, phase, I want to talk about Marcus Aurelius because they, Haidt and Lukianoff, both mention Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Jonathan Haidt is a big fan of Marcus Aurelius. Apparently keeps him on his bed stand. And it's not a coincidence because the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy also was self-consciously adopting Stoic ideas. Marcus Aurelius is a Stoic. Adopting Stoic ideas, Stoic techniques, and adapting them to the 20th century uh, for psychotherapy. So I want to now turn to Marcus Aurelius and give a, a, a broad outline of his philosophy and consider the connections between it and cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and then conclude with a comparison of, of this, these two, um, well, these three authors, Haidt, Lukianoff, and Marcus Aurelius on the one hand, and on the other hand, Freud's approach to trauma. So now I'd like to describe the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. I'd like to describe Stoicism more generally and then quote in a few cases from Marcus Aurelius. Um, I'll just mention the names of the prominent Roman Stoics um, whose texts survive to the present. There are three major ones. Seneca of the first century, who was an, uh, an assistant to Nero, the tutor of Nero. And then Epictetus, a Greek former slave a teacher, whose life straddled the 1st and 2nd century AD and is considered the greatest of the uh, texts that survive. And then Marcus Aurelius from squarely in the 2nd century AD, a Roman emperor of the 2nd century AD, who is relying on Epictetus as the great teacher. So some of what I'll say will be you know, more easily found in Epictetus. Um, you, know, you can dig around for it in Marcus's meditations, but I'll also quote from Marcus himself. So I think to simplify Stoicism, we should consider two major themes, and those are the self and God. So let's start with the self. We talked about Plato in, in a much earlier episode, and Plato thought that the soul, the human soul, had three parts. You might recall reason, um, passion, emotion, uh, the kind of narcissistic element in the middle, and then appetite. The Stoics thought of the, the self as, or the soul, if you like, as one thing, and that is reason. So imagine concentric circles. At the middle of who you are is your reason. And then imagine you know, a widening array of circles. The next would be emotions, and then perhaps appetites, your body, your possessions, other people, your family and friends, and then the whole world. So what is truly yourself is reason, right at the middle of all those circles. And the reason why reason is who you really are is that it's only over your judgment, judgment of what's true and what's false, and your judgment of what's good and what's bad. It is only over your judgment that you have total control. So let's go to the outermost circle in those, that series of circles, I imagine, you know, things in the physical world. I can't control uh, whether the sun rises or falls. Obviously, I have no control over that at all. So it's obvious that that's not who I am. Uh, other people. Well, I can influence other people, especially friends and family. I can persuade them more easily than I can persuade total strangers. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe I could persuade total strangers more. But at any rate, uh, even when I have influence over people, I don't have sufficient complete control uh, over them. So my judgment, my will uh, is not uh, sufficient to determine what happens uh, with other people. So to my possessions. So you know, here is my cookie. I this is my cookie. Uh, I can do with it as I like, but uh, things can happen to this cookie that are outside my control. Someone stronger than I am can come and take this cookie away from me. So it's not uh, I don't have total control over it. Now our body, we're getting closer. Do I have control over my body? Well, I have more control over my body than I have over the rising and setting of the sun. I can raise my arm, I can lower my arm, but again, my control over my body is not total. I don't have 
my will is not sufficient to bring about the changes in my body that I might wish. So if I have paralysis, I wish to raise my arm, but I can't. And of course, uh, diseases and ultimately death make this vivid and, and poignant. Our appetites, my hunger. I can satisfy my hunger by eating, but I can't make it go away. <laughs> my hunger is is beyond my control in that sense. And so it's like other people in the sense I can influence it, I can diminish it, I can satiate it for a time, but it's always going to come back because it's it's out of my control. It's out of my total control. Now we are close to the middle. Uh, the middle was the center of the self, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is reason. We have total control over our judgment and our will when we will something we we control that we will it we are the wills of our we are the willers of our wills and uh, we have we are the judger of our judgments but emotions well it depends how you think about emotions you can think about emotions as passive feelings so you know i if i get angry when somebody cuts me off in traffic that that happened to me uh i didn't have any control over that guy swerving in front of me and I could also think I didn't have any control over my heart starting to pound and, you know, the, the vessels in my forehead popping out, that that's a physiological reaction to that circumstance. I'm a passive recipient of it. It's out of my control. If I think about emotions that way as feelings, as merely feelings and as passive reactions, then emotions would be with the appetites, the body, the possessions, other people in the world outside my control. But that's not how the Stoics think about emotions. They think about emotions as judgments. So when I get angry, I get angry because I have judged that something bad has happened to me. Now, just because I judge something bad has happened to me doesn't mean I feel anger because there are many emotions where I judge that something bad has happened to me. Like envy, for example. I judge it's bad that I don't have the thing that, that you have. So I'm not being fine-grained here, but I'm just trying to indicate that for the Stoics, what an emotion is, is a judgment. It's a judgment of value. It's a judgment of the relationship between myself and the world, especially uh, with other people in the world. So specifically, if you like, when it comes to anger, I judge that I've been insulted. Now, you know, he's, the guy swerves in front of me in traffic, and yes, my blood boils, my heart starts pounding, but that's that's downstream. Those physiological reactions are downstream from me judging that I've been insulted. And the Stoic remedy for many emotions, and this is where we get the uh, common English notion of stoic to be a Stoic, which is partially faithful to Stoics and partially unfaithful to them. They weren't devoid of all emotion. They didn't want to be devoid of all emotion. There were some emotions that they wanted to experience all the time, like gratitude and joy and love. But then there are many emotions that they thought needed to be eliminated uh, from human life. And anger is one of them. Because when I judge that somebody has insulted me, I've made a mistake, they think. Because, uh, you know, when a dog barks at me, I haven't been insulted. Uh, you know, I don't like the sound of the dog, but uh, that doesn't make it an insult. And the dog might be trying to insult me in his own way. But uh, I only get insulted if I feel insulted if I make the misjudgment that I indeed have been insulted. And so too, when a human being uh, tries to insult me, I don't need to be insulted and I won't be unless I judge that I've been insulted. And uh, it goes deeper than that. The Stoic thinks the only thing that really matters about me is my judgment because that's all, that's all that I really am, as we've just discussed. And so when people insult us, usually they're saying, oh, well, you're ugly in your body or you, know, you have stupid friends or you know, you're poor or whatever. And since those things in the stoic estimation of the self are not who I am, uh, you, know, you might as well be talking about uh, the weather. It has nothing to do with me. It's not myself. So all these occasions of insult are in fact not insulting. And anyone who gets angry because they judge they've been insulted has made an error in judgment. So, so much for the self. Now for a God. Well, the Stoics divide the world. Uh, well, in a sense, they don't divide the world. I should say they're materialists. Unlike Plato, who's a 
let's call him a spiritualist for the moment, who thinks that there's a, a separable soul from the body and that there are forms that are eternal and immaterial as opposed to the material perceptible world. Stoics are uh, rigorously monistic. They think there's just one world and it's just this material world. And then you might think, well, what about God? Since I just mentioned him. Well, they think God is the world. The, the material world, the whole, as they often call it, that's God. So they're, they're pantheists. God is everywhere. God's not in us, in his own heaven. God is here in this table. Um, now, you know, we don't have to make fine distinctions about varieties of pantheism, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is the imminent as opposed to transcendent divinity uh, of the Stoic cosmos. I can read a passage from Marcus Aurelius to substantiate that. It's not a controversial point, but it's good to have some contact with his text. He writes... One should continually think of the universe as one living being with one substance and one soul. How all it contains falls under its one unitary perception. How all its actions derive from one impulse. How all things together cause all that happens and the nature of the resulting web and pattern of events. So, Earlier, when I was distinguishing between the true self and then these concentric spheres at the outermost edge was the world. Well, it turns out that world is God. So it's out of my control. And so I'm not responsible for it. But neither should I be anxious about anything that happens in the world because it's all, I I was going to say supervised by God, but that makes it sound like God's different from it and he's supervising something other than himself. It's deeper than that. It's all God. And The Stoics argue that God is omnipotent and benevolent. And so anything that happens is for the best. This is really, it's not the first time this uh, arises in Greek and Roman philosophy, but it's certainly the most clear and consistent um, theodicy in ancient philosophy uh, of the West. By theodicy, I mean the justice of God, that things appear evil in the world, Horrible things seem to happen, but in fact, it's all good. And they have replies as a result to objections about the presence of evil. One of them uh, that you know I, I think really gets at what they're saying. It's like a painting that uh, if you were to focus only on the shadowy parts, you would think this is an ugly painting. It's just black, dark nothingness. But when you step back and you see the whole canvas and see it all as beautiful, you realize that those black, dark shadows were integral to the beauty of the whole. And so too, when you focus on particular instances of evil or what you think to be evil, you're not taking God's perspective, which is stepping back and seeing the whole as beautiful. What role does philosophy play then in the Stoic life? I'll read a passage of Marcus to indicate how important it is. In human life, time is but a point, reality a flux, perception indistinct, the composition of the body subject to easy corruption, the soul a spinning top, fortune hard to make out, fame confused. To put it briefly, physical things are but a flowing stream, things of the soul, dreams and vanity. Life is but a struggle in the visit to a strange land, posthumous fame, but a forgetting. So Marcus can be quite pessimistic and uh, resigned as he is in, in a passage like this where he's talking about how, how life is flux. He's, he's a Heracleitean. He's thinking of, of Heraclitus's river at that point. But at the same time, he can also adopt the perspective, and he often does, that despite this melancholy, he should in fact be responding to this, this flowing world with joy. He should be grateful for it because it's all God. And this book we now call Meditations, uh, it was found with only a title on it uh, for himself or to himself, I can't recall. Um, These were his personal spiritual exercises, as the great scholar Pierre Hadot described them in his great book about Marcus Aurelius. These were not meant for publication. These were Marcus trying to reform his way of thinking about the world. And so you can see here the the nut, the, the, the kernel, the seed of cognitive behavioral therapy. 
his spiritual exercises, his writing of these meditations uh, were his efforts to reform his way of thinking so that he would experience joy, gratitude, and love towards the world instead of this melancholy and resentment. Let me continue with this short quotation. What then can help us on our way? One thing only, philosophy. And there's the cognitive element. This consists in guarding our inner spirit. That's the self that I mentioned earlier as the reason right at the heart, which includes emotions because emotions are judgment. So it's judgment and will at the middle. This consists in guarding our inner spirit inviolate and unharmed, stronger than pleasures and pains, never acting aimlessly, falsely, or hypocritically, independent of the actions or inaction of others. So all those concentric spheres, the Stoic Marcus Aurelius recognizes as not himself, beyond his control, and he doesn't worry about them. He doesn't have responsibility for them. He worries only about his own judgments. But then, of course, it's supplemented, as it isn't in this particular passage, but then it's supplemented with the thought that it's not only that you don't worry about it because it's not under your control, you, you're happy about it because it's under God's control. Let me finish this. Accepting all that happens or is given as coming whence one came oneself, and at all times awaiting death with contented mind as being only the release of the elements of which every creature is composed. If it is nothing fearful for the elements themselves that one should continually change into another, why should anyone look with suspicion upon the change and dissolution of all things? For this is in accord with nature. Nature is God, by the way, in the Stoic mindset. As I mentioned earlier, they don't distinguish between the natural world and the transcendent spiritual world. Nature itself is God. So he says, for this is in accord with nature, and nothing evil is in accord with nature. I'd like to read two more passages to illustrate the relationship between uh, the Stoic self and practical philosophical life, especially in light of God. The attitude of that which rules within us toward outside events, if it is in accord with nature, is ever to adapt itself easily to what is possible in the given circumstances. It does not direct its affection upon any particular set of circumstances to work upon, but it starts out toward its objects with reservations and converts any obstacle into material for its own action. Now, this is crucial. This is the analogy that I'm going to use because it appears in the book by Haidt and Lukyanov. As fire does when it overpowers what is thrown upon it. A small flame might be quenched by it, but a bright fire very rapidly appropriates to itself whatever is put upon it, consumes it, and rises higher because of these obstacles. So that analogy Haidt used, they, instead of uh, fuel, they talk about wind. So just to be faithful to, to Marcus, it doesn't, it doesn't matter in the end. But uh, the way Marcus puts it here is if you have a small flame, like a candle, if you pour gasoline on it, it's going to extinguish the flame. But if you have a bonfire and you pour the same amount of gasoline into the bonfire, the bonfire will convert it immediately into more energy and become stronger. The, in, in the height version, there's a wind. If it, the wind hits the candle, it will blow the candle out. If the wind hits the bonfire, the bonfire will get, will get brighter. The, the wind or the fuel in this case is, as Marcus says, the obstacles of our lives. And if we are small flames, we will be extinguished by those obstacles. If we're small soul people, we'll be crushed by those obstacles. But if we're big soul people, philosophers in his understanding, then we will be uh, given more energy, more life, more strength by obstacles. So we should actually crave obstacles. But it's an important um, thing to recognize that I don't think Marcus or Haidt and Lukianov sufficiently recognize that one can try to become a bonfire rather than a candle, but then also the world presents quantities of fuel or wind. So to use their analogy, a wind. Well, if I'm a really, really strong wind, if, there's, if, I'm, a, if I'm a big fire, if there's a very, very strong wind, it's going to put me out. Uh, it, it'll put out the candle, but it'll also put me out. So obstacles are of greater or lesser extent, uh, more or less threatening. And the emphasis here, both in Marcus and in, in Haidt and Lukianov, is what can the self do to turn obstacles into sources of strength. But there isn't sufficient recognition, I don't think, in Haidt and Lukianov. I'll, I'll say why I don't think this is a problem for Marcus in a moment. There isn't sufficient recognition in them that you can only become so big as a fire uh, 
to the point that some obstacles will crush you. Uh, the, the, the superpower wind, the, the, the dump truck full of gasoline is going to put out uh, the bonfire as well. So the reason why this doesn't this isn't a problem for Marcus is that Marcus has that view of God as providence, God as foreseeing everything, uh, supervising everything, as wishing nothing but the best for himself, the world, and being all powerful to achieve that. So that if I'm crushed by circumstances, I should welcome that as good because that's God's action. And that's Orthodox Stoicism. Cognitive behavioral therapy is, and, and the, the philosophy that Haidt and Lukianov are using in their chapter is Stoicism without providence. So I'm to develop these techniques uh, to a, a adapt to circumstances, to turn obstacles into sources of strength with the optimistic hope that I can become a bonfire from having been a candle. But there isn't the recognition that I was speaking of earlier that there's a difference, now in Freud's terms, between uh, something that impacts the psychic skin and can be absorbed versus something that truly shatters, that ruptures the psychic skin. So that the rupturing of the psychic skin, the force, the traumatic event, that would be like the dump truck full of gasoline that's poured and crushes or extinguishes even, even the bonfire. Let me add one more analogy that Marcus uses. I don't think it appears in the Hyde book, but it's, it's helpful. Uh, that there are colors in the world, and if you have a sick eye, I think he says a jaundiced eye, um, but if you have, if, you, if your eye is weak in some way, you don't want to look at the colors. Uh, they're too bright. They hurt your eyes. You know, just think of light uh, rather than just colors. But if you have a healthy eye, you want to see a lot of colors. You want, you want a bright light so that everything will be revealed to your eye. So that what's harmful to the sick eye is welcomed by the healthy eye. And he wants you to think of the world this way, that it's that much of which you consider harmful it can can be beneficial. In fact, if you're Marcus, everything that you consider harmful is in fact beneficial because it's all under the supervision of God. And that's the difference, uh, again, uh, with the cognitive behavioral therapists and Haidt and Lukianoff's appropriation of that therapeutic method uh, for their discussion of safetyism is that they can't say that every obstacle, every um, color is good to see because or every light is good to see, that you look at the sun during uh, an eclipse and it will blind you. <laughs> and some events are like that to our psyche, so that we're not anti-fragile end of story. We are anti-fragile towards small doses of threats to some colors, to some amounts of fuel, to some winds, but we're fragile when it comes to massive quantities of those things. And then the question will be, as you know, I think about transitioning to um, a discussion of Archangel, which of those events that Sarah experiences were the sorts of events that she uh, could have learned from? I think a barking of a dog, for example, or to think back to playtest, the seeing of the spider. But uh, are there some things from which it was right to have protected her? And you know, then it becomes more ambiguous. You know, it's easy to walk away from Archangel and think, yes, we should throw kids to the world, and uh, then they'll they'll grow and they'll develop emotional maturity. But you know, there are real dangers out there, and it's it's hard. I I'll speak personally as a parent. It's hard to find the points where you treat your kids as anti-fragile and the points where you really should treat them as fragile. Mm -hmm.